Good morning, everybody. Thank you to everyone who dragged themselves out of bed after trivia and other festivities last night to be here in person. And good morning to the 150 plus people who are watching us streaming live. Thank you all for being here. Today's panel is on trumped up trade, retaking the working class and trade in the economy. We all know that Trump used the trade issue as a way to make the case he was for working people. And now, literally next week, he's going to start renegotiating NAFTA. This is a scenario where things could theoretically get better, depending on what he does, or they could get a lot worse. And that's just the policy question. There are also a lot of political implications. So this panel is going to explore both elements, the policy and the political, and we have an amazing panel here. Congressman Keith Ellison, thank you very much, co-chair of the Progressive Caucus. I'm sorry, previously co-chair of the Progressive Caucus. Now our DNC superstar progressive leader. And Congressman, obviously, from Minnesota, Democrat, everyone knows. Erica Andiola, one of our leading activists for immigration rights in the country and a leader at Our Revolution. Mershed Zahid from Creda, Vice President, Politics, Genius Wizard of Campaigning. <laughs> ben Beachy, the Sierra Club's Responsible Trade Director, a guy who is one of the wi wizards and geniuses of the substance of the critique of our current trade policy. And I'm Lori Wallach. I'm the Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. I'm going to start with a little overview and then turn it over to our panelists. Um, the, the basic gist of what we're going to talk about is this NAFTA renegotiation, because that's the first political moment where Trump's rhetoric about trade is going to actually come down to a test. And so why does NAFTA have to be replaced? What the hell is NAFTA? For people who aren't of <clears throat> a certain age, like me, you may not even remember NAFTA. You saw it when you were a kid on TV. So the North American Free Trade Agreement was a radical experiment. It was unlike any past trade agreement. Instead of focusing on trade, it set up all kinds of new corporate rights and powers. And it used the brand free trade agreement. But at its heart are great corporate rights, investor rights, that literally elevate individual companies to the level of a nation state. As well, there are rules that incentivize job offshoring. Everyone wonders how we lost a million jobs to NAFTA. It wasn't an act of God. There are rules in the text of the NAFTA that subsidize offshoring. And that was the model that NAFTA, but even more fierce, for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, an agreement that was stopped after seven years of international progressive civil society campaigning that literally stopped United Corporate Power, People Power won. But with the, TPP, with the NAFTA fight, we risk having TPP 2.0. Mexico and Canada were in the TPP. There's a wing of the Trump administration, and there are a lot of corporate guys who see the NAFTA as a way to revive the dead TPP and set it loose on working people in the environment. Why do we have to replace NAFTA? So NAFTA has been devastating to working people. Under just one government program, 910,000 specific Americans have been certified as having lost their jobs to NAFTA since its existence, 910,000. If you go to tradewatch.org, our website, to the Trade Data Center, through a Freedom of Information Act standing order, we have the entire database, and we have it searchable. You can put in your zip code, your town, the kind of jobs, the company, and you can search those almost a million Americans who lost their jobs to NAFTA. Number two, even if you don't lose your job, when you wash out that many higher wage manufacturing jobs, you put downward pressure on everyone's wages. So all of us have seen lower wages, and particularly for the two-thirds of the working public who don't have college degrees, we've seen wages suppressed because you have a million plus just from NAFTA, five million totally from our current trade policies, manufacturing workers who lost their jobs in the last 20 years, they're now in the pool competing for the same kinds of jobs that a person without a college degree can get. Pushes down wages across the economy. <coughs> and here's a shocker, we even have a trade deficit in agriculture under NAFTA. Small farmers have been clobbered. We've lost over 200,000 independent farms since NAFTA. We went from a $2.4 billion trade surplus with Mexico and Canada to a $6.8 billion deficit we even have a deficit, the cowboy nation, in beef. 
with their NAFTA partners. So basically, the big guys, the packing houses when it comes to agriculture, the big multinational companies that relocated to lower wages, they've done great. But working people, communities, the environment, has been a disaster. And why the environment? Why communities? Because at the heart of NAFTA is investor state dispute settlement, you can see my end ISDS. That's the technical name for a system that literally gives thousands of multinational corporations the power to sue the U.S. government in front of a tribunal of three corporate attorneys. The lawyers can order the U.S. government, us, the taxpayers, to pay unlimited sums, including the company's future expected profits, for any action, government action, court action, regulation, that they say violates their new corporate rights in NAFTA. And the those decisions of the lawyers are not subject to appeal. Almost 400 million has been paid out in NAFTA attacks alone on timber policy, water policy, tax expands. I'm sure Ben's going to talk more about those. Investor State Dispute Settlement, ISDS. It is the dirty secret at the heart of TPP. It is at the heart of NAFTA. That's where it started. It's raw corporate power. Thanks to NAFTA, Canada has lost more of those investor state attacks on its environmental laws than any other developed country. In, in Ben's presentation, I'm sure he's going to talk about these cases, so I'm not. But just to give some examples, an environmental impact statement for a mine was declared to be a violation of corporations' NAFTA rights. Every state, every country has environmental impact statements. An additive that the U.S. government has banned nationally and a lot of states have banned before the U.S. national government is now back in use in Canada because ethyl companies additive MMT, banning that was, was declared a violation of the NAFTA rights of the ethyl corporation. The corporation got $13 million and did not get millions more for its future lost profits. Canada agreed to put that horrible stuff back in the market. Or if you look at, whoops, I think I missed... I lost a slide. Mexico, I lost the Mexico slide, which is a disaster. Mexico has seen more than two million peasant family farms destroyed by the dumping of subsidized corn. We're going to hear about some of the effects in Mexico for Erica, from Erica, but it, it literally gutted, devastated the rural societies in Mexico, but as well, NAFTA has rules that allowed for the first time the Walmarts and the Kmarts to come in. So there were over a million medium-sized manufacturers and retail facilities that were also destroyed. That movement's called El Barzon, it's the word for the yoke on the ox. It is a movement of middle-class Mexicans who thought NAFTA would be good for them, who also got screwed. Only the biggest of the biggest actually won out. And so much more damage. So we are flooded with imported food that doesn't meet U.S. standards, because under NAFTA, all three countries have to accept stuff. Our GMO stuff going to the other countries, Food that doesn't meet our standards going here, you have to accept it. And NAFTA got rid of bans, waves by America, by American, and by local. That means if folks in Georgia or any other state decide they want to invest their state tax dollars into creating jobs, creating innovation, incentivizing some policies, like we want labor unions in this contract, you can't set those kind of conditions. You can't have buy local. Why the hell is that even in NAFTA? as well as all kinds of limits on the regulation of trucks, energy, banking, you name it. NAFTA is not mainly about trade. And it's ongoing damage. Every day, if you look in the news, you see more jobs being offshore. Why? Because NAFTA has incentives that literally make it cheaper and easier to offshore. Because Mexican wages are horrifically low. Talk about a tri-national screw job for working people. Since NAFTA, wages in Mexico are 9% lower, 9% lower in real terms. That's $1,400 less for working people in manufacturing in Mexico now than before NAFTA. And friends, it was not a living wage. It was not a feed your family wage before NAFTA. So the companies are using this race to the bottom and the protections from ISDS to basically, in the most crass, raw way, Screw working people, communities, and the environment in all three countries. And it's worth saying this and talking about the ongoing damage because, for many progressives, the fact that Donald Trump says NAFTA sucks means we're all second guessing. Hmm, does NAFTA really suck? Because I don't agree with anything that guy says. Except in reality, progressives have made this critique for 25 years and Trump hijacked it. 
Which gets to, then, what is going to happen now. Is the Trump administration actually going to renegotiate NAFTA in a way that makes it better? Can be done. Needs to be done. For the sake of not just us, but our brothers and sisters in Mexico and Canada. Or is it going to make it worse? Which is totally doable by adding in the TPP pieces. So what would good mean? On process, it means getting rid of what currently are 600 official corporate advisors and opening up the process. On substance, getting rid of the incentives for offshoring, getting rid of the ban on Buy America, putting in real labor and environmental standards to raise wages and working conditions and environmental standards in all three countries, getting rid of the ban on how we use our local tax dollars. What the hell is that doing in a trade agreement? Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. should decide well, how they want to invest their tax dollars for the sake of their country. We need to make sure all food, goods, services meet our domestic rules. It's not a damn trade issue as long as you don't discriminate. So the rule is you come here, you meet our rules. You go there, you meet their rules. The people who are going to live with the results get to decide, not NAFTA. As well, we need to get rid of the rules of NAFTA that drive up medicine costs, their new patent protections for big pharmaceutical companies, change the agriculture rules so small guys have a chance, not just the big guys, and then there's some real trade things, stopping trade cheating in currency, in what are called the rules of origin, and making sure they're big exceptions when important laws get attacked. So the situation with the Trump administration, we don't know. There's an internal battle. Trump's way out in the limb having promised NAFTA renegotiation would be better for working people, meaning trade deficit down, jobs up. And guess what? That gets measured every month. Once they do a deal, if they do a deal. Bureau of Labor Statistics comes out with manufacturing data every month. ITC comes out with trade data. So we will know if he held up to what he promised, and we will be able to hold him accountable. Same thing with the Buy America. He says he's Buy America, Buy Local. Let's see what they do. What everyone can do. Hold your members of Congress accountable. Don't need to do that with Keith, but there's some other members who are kind of mm, finger in the air, Democrats and Republicans alike. Replace NAFTA.org, <coughs> postcards, petitions, sign one, you get on the list, put it in the pile on the way out. It is an online community of people working on NAFTA replacement. Replace NAFTA.org is a website with every kind of tool you could possibly want. You can order t-shirts, banners, signs, it's all kinds of campaign activities a way to connect in with the people across the country doing the work. If ISDS really is what floats your boat, separate website, more details, isdscorporateattacks.org. You can get a NAFTA toolkit. It will get mailed to you with everything printed out and ready to go. Over 500 of those have been sent out already in the last couple of months. And if you sign on to our email list, GTW email, you get updates on all of this. And of course, lots of great social media. And now, on to the rest of the program. First, I'm going to introduce Ben Beachy, the director of the Responsible Trade Program at the Sierra Club. Sorry. Ben, come on up. Make sure you capture. Lots of good resources. How's everyone doing? Caffeinated? Good. Good. All right, so my name's Ben. I work at the Sierra Club. Why is the Sierra Club concerned with trade? We have a lot of things we're fighting, everyone in this room. We have a lot of things we're fighting. We're fighting climate injustice, we're fighting environmental injustice, pipelines, we're getting attacked on all fronts. Why would we decide to get into trade? The short answer is we didn't. Trade decided to get into us. As we saw, as Lori just mentioned, when we were starting with the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, we started seeing that these trade deals went far beyond what most of us think of as trade. Not this, not just goods crossing borders, but more of this. A mysterious set of rules that are binding on how our economies and governments can operate. Which begs the question of who's writing these rules? And Lori mentioned that there's a system of an official system of over 500 advisors who help who have privileged access to secret trade negotiating texts. Who is writing these rules? It's over 85% of them actually explicitly represent corporations. So who are these guys who are writing these, these trade rules? If you look at the, for the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, who is writing the rules regarding energy, which tend to have an impact on environmental protection? Well, we've got in the room uh, Halliburton, pioneer of fracking. Uh, Big Coal is there, Chevron's there, Sierra Club is not there. No one at this table up here is there, right? So if corporations are starting, are the ones who are actually writing these rules, 
Maybe it should not come as such a surprise that the end result is less about trade and more about corporate handouts. And that's what NAFTA is. NAFTA is a grab bag of corporate handouts. And we don't have to talk about the hypotheticals to see what the impacts of those ha handouts have been, because we've got 23 years of evidence. So I'm going I'm to specifically focus on one of the, I think, most pernicious uh, corporate handouts uh, in NAFTA. NAFTA gave corporations this, this right. Corporations, but not people, can cross borders. Under NAFTA, corporations, but not people, can cross borders. The express purpose of NAFTA, right, was to make it easier for corporations to cross borders looking for the lowest cost of doing business. Well, if you're in the United States and you're facing NAFTA and you're looking to go to Mexico and you're saying, well, hey, how could I save a buck by going to Mexico? There are a few things that Lori mentioned that maybe will help you out. The manufacturing wage right now, the average one in the United States is $21 an hour. In Mexico, it's $2 an hour. You might save a buck there. How about environmental protection? It turns out that Mexico inspects its border factories for compliance with environmental laws less than half as often as we do. So if you're a corporation that's thinking, I wonder if I could you know, pollute and get away with it, you've got twice as good a chance of doing so if you move your factory across the border. What this has meant is a race to the bottom in labor and environmental standards and the offshoring of both jobs and pollution. What has it actually meant for our communities? I'm going to tell a quick example. In 2009, we got passed in the United States a new protection against lead. All of us have read the science, right? Like, there's no level of lead that's safe for babies and for infants particularly. And groups like the Sierra Club and many others pushed for years to try to get new protections against lead, and we won. In 2009, we got this new protection support, helping our communities avoid lead contamination. Well, what happened was there were these uh, batteries that, that are, you find in your car, car batteries. They're called lead acid batteries. And these corporations that were producing them, they used to recycle them in U.S. factories, many of them in the Midwest. After, they, after this passage of this new policy protecting our communities from lead in 2009, it became more costly to recycle those batteries in the United States because they had to make sure they weren't contaminating the air with lead. So what did they do instead? They decided to export lead acid batteries in mass to Mexico, to northern Mexico, to have them processed in factories in northern Mexico. Why? Because in, under NAFTA, they could do so. NAFTA opened the borders for them to do so. And in Mexico, the lead protections are one-tenth as strong as they are in the United States. And so the, you might ask, was there any health impact of this? Turns out there was. An academic team went down uh, to Mexico and looked at the health impacts in local communities, found underweight babies being born at higher rates since the passage of this policy in the United States. So this is not hypothetical. Babies are literally being born right now in northern Mexico with elevated levels of lead in their blood because of the race to the bottom that NAFTA helped enable. And I want to pause here because I think this gets to the crux of the real problem with these trade deals. You know, Trump likes to frame these trade deals as the U.S. versus Mexico. Well, who won here? Did the U.S. win? I mean, we got new protections uh, from, for our communities against lead, but at the expense of jobs. The jobs in those factories that used to recycle those batteries left. Where did they go? They went to Mexico. So maybe Mexico won here. Well, Mexico got those jobs, but at what cost? at the cost of, of children being born with elevated levels of lead in their blood. Who won, U.S. or Mexico? Clearly, it was not communities on either side of the border. The only ones who won in this equation were corporations. And that is the essential fallacy of Trump's frame. It is not the U.S. It is not the U.S. versus other countries. These trade deals are not the U.S. versus other countries. It is corporations versus the rest of us. How do we change this? Well, we need to, to stop uh, 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 the race to the bottom, we need to have a binding floor of labor and environmental protections. That means that if you're going to ha be able to take your business across borders, we need to make sure that on both sides of the borders, we have very strong worker protections, environmental protections, health protections. That means enforcing important international agreements like labor conventions and also the Paris Climate Agreement. 
Why is it important to have the Paris Climate Agreement in our trade deals? Because if you're a corporation and you're emitting carbon, you're polluting the, the climate in this country, and you decide to take your business abroad so as to avoid new climate protections, and so as you can emit freely, the atmosphere doesn't care where your carbon was emitted. It doesn't matter whether you polluted the climate in Manitoba or Michigan or Michoacan. It still drives climate change. But trade deals like NAFTA, by turning a blind eye to the climate impacts, are an instrument of climate denial. Now, is Trump going to actually include the Paris Climate Agreement into a renegotiated NAFTA? Well, I, I'll eat my foot if that becomes the case. Uh, what is Trump going to do? Um, we got a sample of it. It's hard to know because it's very opaque, but there was a negotiating objectives recently released on what Trump wants to do with regard to labor and the environment. And he said, let's um, copy and paste the labor and environmental terms from the TPP. You might remember this deal. And a lot of people didn't like it. Most of the people up here, everyone up here, and most leading labor and environmental groups across the country said the labor and environmental terms of the TPP are far too weak, and thus we reject this deal. And Trump himself claimed credit and said that he claims to hate this deal. Now he wants to copy and paste provisions from the TPP and insert it into NAFTA. And so there's a very clear message for Trump here. If you expect NAFTA 2.0 to be a way to revive the TPP, you should expect to revive the movement of millions across borders, sectors, and party lines that killed the TPP in the first place. Uh, Lori mentioned corporate protection number two, which is that corporations not only can uh, bypass our protections by taking their businesses elsewhere and offshoring jobs and pollution, but they can straight up sue us in unaccountable tribunals of corporate lawyers. And for the sake of time, I'm going to, you've already got a lot of the specifics on, on the impact, so I'm going to skip that in question and answer. We can go to more stories. Uh, I'm going to skip right to what do we do? What do we do? Trump is simultaneously, so we have this grab bag of corporate profit, uh, of corporate handouts, right? That is NAFTA. Trump is simultaneously trying to fill that grab bag with even more corporate handouts and claiming successfully the mantle of trade populism. How, how do we act in this fear? Do we just step back and let him cede this territory and let Trump dominate the, the trade space? Of course not. We fight, we win. What does that mean? I think it ha requires us to not only rail against the bad, but rail for the good. To state very clearly what our clear, bold vision is for a new trade model. One that can replace NAFTA and replace all of these unfair trade deals. And that, why do we want to do that? Because we want to indict Trump. We need something to show that here's the yardstick. Here's the yardstick by, that is the ideal. Here's the, our vision for what trade needs to look like. Trade that supports workers, communities, clean air and water, health on, both, on all sides of the border. And use that yardstick to indict Trump. Because right now, Trump is using trade as a reliable source of political capital. If we can put out a yardstick and use it to judge, to indict Trump's, whatever comes out of the Trump administration, then we can turn trade from a political asset for Trump into a political liability. And that, my friends, would be a service to all of us, to our broad movement, to def our defense against all the attacks coming at us from the Trump administration. So how do we do that? We don't need to look for new content on what a new vision would be. Um, we can always imagine more and more ideas, but we don't need to start from scratch. Here are just four examples of, of reports that come out just in the last year, including by some of the people at this table, uh, on what a climate-friendly trade agreement could look like, what worker-friendly trade could look like, what family-farmer-friendly trade could look like, what consumer-friendly trade could look like. We have a lot of ideas. I think one thing that we're lacking is a frame. The first protest I went to, and I'm going to date myself, it was in college, it was around 2000, 2001. I think the first sign I saw at that protest said, people and planet over profits. That turns out to be the sign that we're still using today. Now, it's an interesting frame. You know, I like alliteration. Who doesn't like it? People, planet, profits, that's good. But it kind of tugs at your head. I'm not sure if it really tugs at your heart. What are the values in that? 
I think we need to search for a more values-based frame that really speaks to people, that captures hearts and minds. But, uh, recently, some Democrats came out with, quote, uh, their, their attempt at a new, a new frame, this was just recently, uh, Schumer came out and said, you know, we need a, a better deal on trade and jobs. Listen to that. Does that the sound of your heart tugging? <laughs> yeah, it, m not mine either. So I think the Democratic Party is really needs to search for its soul on trade and figure out what is its frame? How can, how can they stand up uh, to the, the Trump administration uh, on trade? And we have people to thank, like Congressman Ellison here, for helping trying to lead the Democratic Party back to their soul on trade. I, it, it's critical because uh, we need to look for new frames, like maybe it's family. Maybe we can say no one, <coughs> no one should have to wonder how they're going to feed their child next month because a bad trade deal meant exporting their job. No one should have to wonder whether their child has lead in their blood because a bad trade deal meant importing pollution. Maybe it's not family, maybe it's human rights, the right to dignified work, the right to clean air and water. Or maybe it's populism, maybe it's the Bernie-esque, millionaires and billionaires are getting all the gains and the rest of us are getting screwed. All of these frames have two things in common. One, they're true, and two, they don't replicate Trump's frame. And I think that's critical. Because we're not going to beat Trump at his own game by repli replicating a xenophobic frame. And so if we uh, do so, we risk inadvertently amplifying Trump's political capital while amplifying the xenophobia, racism, and misogyny that is strewn throughout this frame <coughs> on trade. To conclude, I would say that not only is this quest for a, a vision, uh, to, uh, an opportunity, a tool to indict Trump, it's also a tool to build power. Last month, we were in Detroit. We brought into the room immigrant rights activists, environmental justice activists, communities of color fighting local incinerators, big green hippies from the Sierra Club, and unionists, including some who voted for Trump. These groups do not necessarily trust each other, but they can all agree that they hate NAFTA. And that's something. We can start with that and build common cause and use the quest for a new trade vision to break down the silos that divide us. And that is critical because if we do our job, Trump is not going to be with us in shortly over three years. And it's incumbent on us to make sure we lay the groundwork now so that we have both the vision and the movement to support it when Trump's agenda is gone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. I'd like to introduce Erica. Erica Andiola, in a way, needs no introduction. Um, she's been such a leader in the immigrants' rights movement, and our revolution is very lucky to have her now as one of their leaders. And she's going to share a perspective that is both a political and policy one, but a personal perspective. Thank you. You all can hear me, right? Nice. This is fun. All right, great. Well, let's, let's talk about immigration, and what does that have to do with NAFTA? We usually don't talk about it, uh, either from the NAFTA side of uh, our activism or our immigrant rights side of activism. Um, I know that because I've been, I've been organizing with the immigrant rights movement for the past uh, nine years or so, and you know this is sort of a, for me, um, you know this is something that I've known at a personal level of how NAFTA has impacted Mexico and how it has impacted people that have come into this country. Uh, but we don't necessarily connect the dots often. Um, now, why is it important to connect those dots? Well, because we have a current president who ran on, on, on two things, right? One is we need to get rid of NAFTA. We need to get rid of these trade agreements. But also, we need to get rid of undocumented people in this country. <laughs> right? And so Trump was really good at scapegoating immigrants and talking about us in a way that could give you know American people sort of a sense of like okay somebody somebody needs to blame here right somebody needs to be blamed for losing jobs, and maybe that's not the corporations in his mind maybe that should be immigrants right so it's it's really easy to scapegoat us right we come and we take jobs that's what that's his narrative <clears throat> now why uh, why do we have to care about NAFTA when it comes to immigration well NAFTA was basically uh, a trade policy that devastated Mexico's economy. Uh, during the 90s, we had millions of Mexicans. There was about, uh, before NAFTA, there was about 2.9 million Mexicans in this country in 1995. Uh, that number went up to 6.9 million people in this country that immigrated from Mexico into the U.S. 
after NAFTA happened. That was in the 90s. Um, how did that happen? Well, there was already some uh, <coughs> statements uh, in the in previous statements about Mexico's economy. But unfortunately, what ended up happening is that people in rural areas, so people who were growing their corn in Mexico, unfortunately ended up losing their, their job, which was basically growing corn. Why? Because we ended up getting tons of corn from the United States. And so all of those people who were growing that, you know, their, 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 their crops and their corn ended up having to migrate into, into the cities, trying to look for jobs, trying to look for uh, a way of living, and unfortunately, they couldn't find it. And not only that, we had small businesses who uh, were destroyed. We had middle, you know, businesses that were a little bigger also destroyed. And so you ended up having people competing for jobs in Mexico during this time. And um, we also have places like maquiladoras, you know, places where you ended up having tons of, of, of Mexicans trying to figure out how to make a living out of, I don't even remember how much they were getting paid, but they were getting paid very, very little. It was not necessarily something that they could use to feed their children. Um, well, how do, how do I know that? I mean, I, I haven't lived in Mexico for the past 20 years of my life. I'm a DACA recipient. I live here in the United States. I've been here for, for a while. And I, the first time I went back to Mexico was about a year ago because I was able to get uh, permission to, to come back with, with DACA. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, I still remember being in Mexico when I was a child. I still remember the changes in my own community uh, to going to shop at the really small, you know, smaller businesses in my neighborhood to all of a sudden having a Costco um, a couple of miles away from my house. And people actually literally, you know, not necessarily going to the small business anymore, but actually going to Costco and Walmart to, to shop. And just recently, I was, uh, not too long ago, I was asking my mom, um, about her small town where she grew up. Um, I remember going into this town when I was a child, and years later I would come back, and there was less and less people. And I just wondered, I was like, I have never asked you about this, but you know where you grew up, where you used to take me? The small town where it was like delicious food and, and, and amazing tortillas made by, you know, by, by the people there, what, what happened? And she, she was telling me this story, and I had, I had never connected the dots, and she says, when you were there, when you were very, very little, there was a lot of people there. But eventually, when I used to take you back, there was a company, an American company that migrated, that, that went from the United States to, to Mexico, to that specific part of where she was born. And um, they opened up this company, and it's a paper company. And they had a lot of waste that they needed to, to get rid of. So they put it all in the river, where uh, we used to fish. And the same river that we used to use to grow our, our crops. And so when that happened, um, everybody who was, or the majority of those people that were living in that town are now in Chicago. <laughs> so the majority of our family members are over there in Chicago or Arizona or California. And so we don't think about that when we think about um, you know, trade agreements and how right now we are talking about immigration as if people come here because there's all these pooling factors from the United States, but we never think about the pushing factors that have caused the economies of these countries to push people to come into the United States. There's the CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, which was also uh, unfortunately gang-related and uh, violence in Central America actually went up after ha uh, CAFTA happened. Mm -hmm. Now you have children who are literally migrating on their own in which, unfortunately, both sides, Republicans and Democrats, you know, even in the primary last time, we had, you know, Hillary Clinton talking about how we should send these kids back to their country because they shouldn't be coming or they shouldn't be sending him on their own. Um, <coughs> or you have, you know, people just migrating from Central America, really going, leaving the violence or leaving the, uh, the poverty that they have grown up in. And again, we don't think about Kafka. How did that have an impact in their lives? And why are they migrating into the United States? So, just in, in summary, I would love for us to start talking a lot more of why NAFTA, why CAFTA, and all these trade agreements have also impacted workers, not just in the United States, but also in Mexico and Canada. There's other countries who have been impacted by these trade agreements, and if we don't talk about that, we're going to continue to have people like Donald Trump 
framing that narrative for us, framing the narrative of immigrants coming into this country to take jobs, when the reality is that we have a bigger and stronger power to fight, which is corporations really pinning us against each other. And it's really, again, it's really easy for him to come and say, yes, immigrants are taking your jobs, but n Trump is never going to tell the truth. So it is our duty and it is our responsibility to really put that framing and put it out there into the American people that know this is not about immigrants coming to, to take your jobs. This is about us uniting to make sure that we are fighting against these corporations, um, pinning us against each other. And so um, I would just encourage you all, I, you know, I usually don't work in, in not, I'm not an economist, I, this is not something that I'm an ex expert on, but I can tell you that this is, a, this, is a, 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 this is a very important time for us to start speaking about this. And also asking our, our members of Congress, right? Let's make sure that anything that happens with NAFTA is not only going to be um, affecting in a positive way workers in America, but also that we think about a way to replace these agreements and something, uh, with something that's going to be raising the living standards for workers in all countries uh, that these agreements are going to be affecting. And so that's, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Erica, very much. The perspective of thinking about this as corporations against, in, against people in all three countries really is key, both because that's the reality, but also as we think about the frame as progressives, we're for international connections and international rules. The question is, are they rules that are for people or rules that are for corporations? And fundamentally, that is part of the policy challenge but there's also a political challenge. And so our next speaker, Rashad, from Credo, is um, going to speak a little bit about the corporate power dynamic, a dynamic that is politically very compelling across political parties, but also that is at the heart with the ISDS, the corporate rights to offshore, to trash the environment at the heart of NAFTA. And, and then we're going to move to Congressman Ellison, who will wrap it all up for us and give us some marching orders, and we'll have a discussion. Rashad. Thank you, Lori. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be here with Congressman Allison, uh, with the ultimate progressive champion, Lori Wallach, who I think is the smartest, the most brightest, and the most just political lobbyist in, in D.C., and with two outstanding leaders in the movement. Now, in terms of why this issue is so important and so important to the progressive community, uh, I would like to use the first couple of minutes of my time to bring in a ringer and have her sort of giving a little taste and reset of why this is such a big deal. So if you, if you indulge me a bit, I will play this. America shouldn't be signing lousy trade deals, period. Which is why I wanted to thank Credo members for keeping up the pressure to stop the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the TPP. So what is this fight all about? Supporters of the TPP want you to believe this deal is about America's role in setting the rules of international trade. But here's the problem. TPP isn't about helping American workers set the rules. It's about letting giant corporations rig the rules on everything from patent protection to food safety standards, all to benefit themselves. Now, the first clue about who benefits from TPP is who actually wrote it. During the top secret drafting process, 28 trade advisory committees were formed to whisper in the ear of our trade negotiators. Who sat on those committees? 85% were senior corporate executives or industry lobbyists. And many of the committees, including those on chemicals and pharmaceuticals, aerospace equipment, textiles and clothing, and financial services, were 100% industry representatives. In more than half of all the advisory committees, no one, not one single person, was in the room who represented American workers or American consumers. You know, a rigged process produces a rigged outcome. Take a look at the Investor State Dispute Settlement, or ISDS. I, I know, sounds wonky, 
But this is the part that gives a huge boost to big multinational companies when they want to challenge a country's laws that they just don't like. Usually, they would have to go to a court. But with TPP, they can skip the courts and use industry-friendly arbitration panels staffed with corporate lawyers. And here's the deal. Whatever those panels say goes. No appeals anywhere. These fines can cost a country billions of dollars. And some countries will just back down and change their regulations instead of fighting back. Workers, environmentalists, human rights advocates, they don't get to use ISDS. It's only the big corporations that do. Now that is a rigged system. This isn't just speculation. This is real. Last year, a mining company won an ISDS case when Canada said the company couldn't blast off the coast. So I'm going to stop there. I, I meant to stop uh, right when she said this isn't, you know, this isn't, this is just a rigged system. And as Lori said, you know, the issue comes down to it again and again, and I think Ben said it too. Who is this supposed to be about? Is it supposed to be about corporations or is it supposed to be about the people? And <coughs> The term that we are all talking about a lot today is ISDS. And now if you look at the naming of this provision, it's not an accident, right? It says Investor State Dispute Settlement. Now think about it again. Investor. Who does it represent? That represents Wall Street. And then there is state. Investor dash state. So essentially, they are sending a signal is putting the corporations and the state all at the same level and putting people right under it. Now, the, uh, get, this gathering couldn't be more timely. Just this Tuesday, we, uh, the industry groups wrote a letter to the Trump, uh, Trump administrations who are currently working on NAFTA that their top priorities in strengthening NAFTA is intellectual property law and ISDS. And, you know, to put it Bluntly, ISDS is nothing more than a corporate power, power graph. Senator Warren said it, Lori said it, you know, Ben uh, alluded to it. I mean, what, what is it again? It is essentially, it gives corporations power to litigate all issues related to trade deals in front of a secret tri uh, tribunal of three corporate lawyers. And they can force tax, uh, they can issue judgments and they can force taxpayers uh, to pay up gobs of billions of amount of billions of amount of money and there's no power to appeal and and then there's this there's a massive conflict of interest issues this judges the so-called judges uh, who sit on these panels you know they will they'll uh, they will adjudicate these panels and the very next day they will go on to represent these corporations now how you know how does that work and what are the results of it well the the concerns about it is no longer hypothetical now, countries already have been forced to pay up billions of dollars of taxpayers' money in judgment. I believe right now there's $36 billion in ongoing cases. There's $392 million that has been paid out to corporations on NAFTA. And there's ISDS attacks that's currently pending on toxic bans, energy land use policies, and timber and water safeguards. And so, you know, in other words, the threat is not hypothetical, and it has set up a system, a famous candidate that once said, that is completely rigged. It is totally rigged. Now, the good news here is, you know, this is so disconcerting uh, and it's so controversial. And, and a lot of people do know about it and do know about it because of the amazing activism that friends from our labor community, friends from our environmental community, and the progressive community in general have stepped up because of the leadership of stars like Congressman, Congressman Ellison and also leadership of organizations like Public Citizen. You know, Credo has been fully, you know, I, I was going to use the term locked and loaded, but I no longer can, no longer can use that term anymore. But, uh, you know, Credo has been fully zeroed in on TPP for the last two and three years. This was one of our signature campaign, one of our core campaigns. And, and for such a wonky issue, the response that was just stunning. Like we had, like we had collected from our email community something like over three million signatures. 
over uh, in less than two years, people speaking out against trade deal. Three million signatures from hardcore progressive activists from left flanks. They made over 51,000 calls to Congress trying to stop this uh, deal on its tracks. And it got very close to it during the Obama administration and then finally got it done. And, you know, over 23,000 letters, and organizationally we have been stepping up by funding amazing organizations like Public Citizen. And the video that Senator Warren that put out right there, wonky video, we put it up, we thought it's, we, were, we would get like 20,000 views or 30,000 views and call it a successful day, but ended up getting like over 700,000 views over to watch that whole five-minute video. You know, and that's... You know, th things like that made a difference. Now, ISDS has become a dirty word. It's become a dirty word within, within, within the folks who, not just who follow trade deals, but in the progressive community. It, people got, people got rid of the fact that these trade deals are not fair. They're being, uh, they're being set up by corporations in the back rooms, and they're being set up to give corporations a huge benefit. Now, you know, somebody figured this out that this was a raw deal, and uh, you know, Unfortunately for us, that guy is sitting in the White House and occupying it. He figured it out last year that this was in the zeitgeist of not just in, uh, not, not just in the core progressive community, but, but really in the heartland and all over the country. And, you know, I don't need to, I'm not going to go poll wonky. I think people can read, read up memos by Stan Greenberg and our favorite, uh, other pollsters. And if you go through and... Uh, uh, drill into all the cross tabs, you will find out how concerns and anxiety of the trade deals played a big issue in states like Pennsylvania, states like Wisconsin, states like Michigan, and you know what happened there. But, but what we have going for us, Trump is nothing but a hypocrite. You know, he is a complete hypocrite. He is never going to match, match his words with action. And this is where he is actually extremely vulnerable. You know, Trump can talk a big game on NAFTA, but here are the facts. He has 14 Canadian and two Mexican investments. Some of his clothing lines are made in Mexico. He, and, and, you know, here's the thing. He's not going to divest his business holding. He's not going to disclose his taxes. So nobody really going to know how provisions like ISDS is going to benefit him personally and his uh, uh, empire that is ripe with massive web of corruption, you know, and then look at uh, look at the personnel in his office, you know, in his cabinet, his swampy cabinet that we call National Economic uh, uh, Council uh, Chief Gary Cohn at Goldman Sachs pushed for ISDS. His Secretary of State Rex Tillerson comes from Exxon Mobil, who launched the tax on ISDS. You know, and the negotiating objectives that the administration laid out that Ben alluded to so far, has, uh, so far does not do anything to ISDS. <coughs> it, was, it was basically a cut and paste job of the TPP. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why that TPP video from Senator Warren is just as relevant today as it was in the last couple of years. Now, don't, I say this is, uh, while we, I present all of this, I actually am relishing this fight because progressives, Democrats, have a massive opportunity here. This fight is a gold mine for Democrats and progressives. And, you know, uh, and, and here's why. We know Trump is not going to deliver on ISDS. ISDS is going to be one of our bright red lines in this fight, along with the other key principles when it comes to protecting worker rights, food safety, um, uh, food safety and benefits, of, uh, and making sure that uh, folks from both sides of the order do not lose out. But ISDS is going to be on the, one of the bright red lines, and we have a massive opportunity coming out with what we hear from the uh, you know, Trump Trade Commission. If if, only if they somehow release a NAFTA version that has ISDS, then that's great. You know, if they deliver us that unicorn, that's awesome. But that's going to be a progressive accomplishment. Because this is something we want, prevailing over corporations. And you know who that's going to put on a tough spot? Tough spot? Trump's BFF, Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan. <laughs>
They're going to have a good old time talking about what they're going to do with it. And then we're going to make sure every, we're going to push all the Democrats that need to be pushed. We're pretty sure Congressman Ellison, Keith Warren, and all the progressive champions, we, we won't need to push them. They're going to do push internally for us. But we're going to get all the Democrats in line and tell them that you're going to champion this and you're going to put McConnell and uh, Ryan on the spot to pass it. But if there is no ISDS, or if there is no, if, if it does not include uh, uh, key protections for worker rights, environmental issues, make, uh, making sure um, big farmer prices are not rein, you know, reined in, if it does not include the provisions, the key provisions that our friends in the labor community, friends in the environment community are not asking for, we are going to have to tell Democrats, you, you will have to stop this. And the best news of it, uh, best news here, they are going to need Democratic votes to pass it, any revised NAFTA version. They're going to need Democratic votes in the Senate, and they're going to need Democratic votes in the House. And Democrats will have a huge leverage to really <coughs> stick it to Trump, expose him as a phony, fake, populist grifter that he is. And, you know, and, and that's, that's why this fight is so important, and I, I really believe it's going to get bigger. It's going to get hotter. It's going to be, become one of the most important fights in, in, in the upcoming months. You know, we have been engaging on this for the, in the recent weeks. I believe there's already over 75,000 folks have signed our, our new wonky petition on NAFTA. And, and we are uh, really extremely grateful to have uh, leadership of Lori and, and in Congress have leadership of uh, Congressman Ellison who is going to lead the charge for consent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nershad. So we're about to hear from Congressman Ellison, and Nershad's done a great job summarizing the situation. It could be a win either way. If this administration, because they realize they're going to have political disaster if they don't deliver on some of this, actually make some real changes, we will have won because it's our agenda and it will make the Republicans in Congress nuts. And in fact, that kind of real replacement of NAFTA would need Democratic votes to pass because those guys aren't going to vote to cut corporate power. And that would put the president sideways with the Republicans in Congress. Interesting situation. Alternatively, if they end up coming back with a NAFTA renegotiation that makes it worse or is just the same old corporate garbage, then that really is a bright line showing that the president has not delivered his pledges to working people. And ISDS really is that line in that, as Merced said, the corporations have been demanding, a hundred of them in a letter last week, that ISDS stay in and be expanded. And if we make as our red line, and it is the demand, uniting labor, environmental, consumer, and family farm groups, we make that a really clear thing. What side are you on? The people or the corporations? And with that note, a guy who has always been on the side of the people, Congressman Keith Ellison, one of our champions and dear friends, who's going to tie this all together for us and give us some direction, and then we'll do Q&A. Congressman Ellison. I, I don't need this, so... Uh, I'm going to escape you out of that. Well, let's just close it. Does it shut off if we close it? I don't know. Do we need it? Yep, there you go. Hey, everybody. So um, I remember 2009, and there was this thing called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. <clears throat> a lot of people, except for folks like Lori, knew what it even was. <laughs> they were up on the hill talking about where's this trade deal. And I remember, I think it was Lori, I'm not sure exactly who, but they said, it's the worst trade deal you never heard of. They said it's NAFTA on steroids. And we all thought, well, of course we have to fight it. But, I mean, really breaking through on trade, is, it's not that easy to do. I mean, you know, I, I've had hundreds and thousands of community meetings, and it's just not always easy to make that a top issue. But somehow we did. We got community meetings all over the country. We had weekly meetings. Sometimes it felt like daily meetings on the Hill. <laughs> and we were able to make TPP a key election issue. By the time the presidential primary came around, 
Everybody had kind of heard of TPP. Where do you stand on TPP? There was a big fight, I'll never forget it, when we were fighting the precursor to TPP, which is Trade Promotion Authority, so-called TPA, which is the thing that where basically Congress votes to give away its power to negotiate <coughs> trade deals. And we had a big fight about that. Actually, all but 28 Democrats voted no. In fact, it was so tense that the President Obama had to come down, talk to the good Democratic caucus, and still only 28 people voted for it. And those were the same 28 who said they were voting for it before. I'm telling you, uh, this is a moment that feels a lot like that moment. When we were trying to get people's focus on this looming trade fight, and we needed everybody to get all hands on deck to help, to help marshal it. So it is, this is a great panel, very timely panel. Uh, and, I, and I will agree with this idea that, you know, we, gotta, we need, always need more great ideas. Absolutely, we need more great ideas. But what we really need now is for people to begin to raise the profile of this issue. That's the thing that we really need. We know we have to stand against ISDS. We have to stand against the so-called intellectual property stuff, and I'll get to that in a moment. But my point is, the real thing is that not enough people know that when Trump says we're going to renegotiate NAFTA, that that's not necessarily a good thing from worker people, from workers' standpoint. Now here's a twist. There's a guy named Lighthizer who was the USTR, <coughs> who, you know, you hate to say Trump does anything right, but I mean, if you look at other USTRs that we've had to deal with, Democrat and Republican, you cannot fairly say he's as bad as all the rest. You can look at his record and he's actually stood for some things we think are good. But he's in an administration with people who are diametrically opposed to him. So you, we've, we've already seen in the Trump administration warring factions within the White House. That's, there's going to be a replay. The point here is that if we demand no, US, no uh, in investor state provisions, we demand that, there, that the, uh, in the intellectual property provisions be short so that they cannot just hold, uh, charge monopoly prices for drugs into the future forever. And if we demand that labor standards actually be lifted as opposed to dropped, environmental standards be lifted as opposed to drop, food security be lifted as opposed to drop, there are people even in this administration who might be open to this, these arguments. And I can tell you that there was a number of Republicans who I talked to when we were fighting over TPA and TPP, I think we had about 27 of them actually sign a letter. Is that right? Is that the right number? Mm -hmm. Sign a letter saying we're not in favor of uh, the way these TPP negotiations are going, and we're not, and we're no on TPA. So my point is, there, there, there is, there's actually a rare moment where there could be some uh, bipartisan cooperation on a better trade model. And let me just say this, the opponents, our opponents, like to say these people are anti-trade, they're protectionists. I want to confess to you that's not true about me. I am not against trade. I am against trade that damages worker rights, that undermines food security, that ruins our environment. If you can develop a trade model which enhances those things, I'll vote for it. But I've never had a chance to vote for a trade model that I, that I thought was right. I view trade as kind of like gravity. It's going to happen. But do you land on your head or do you land on your feet? We are negotiating the terms of trade. And thus far, they have been completely unacceptable. And so we have to continue to fight. Now let me just say this about ISDS. It is an assault on national sovereignty. How somebody like Steve Bannon, who I disagree with everything this guy stands for, could stand by when American courts will be circumvented 
because multinationals want it so, that would just prove he doesn't actually believe in anything other than his own acquisition of power. How, in, in, on this issue of, uh, of, of uh, intellectual property, it's, uh, I mean, don't be fooled on this, right? On the one hand, it's like, well, we don't want to see American inventions being knocked off by folks around the world. Of course we don't. I believe that if you invent something, there ought to be some period of time where you can get some benefit from your invention. Recoup that. But what this thing has turned into is a permanent monopoly rents that are being charged for life-saving drugs. And we can't tolerate that. And let me also say this, one of the another, another horrible aspect of, of, uh, of ISDS, I mean, I, I kind of like the fact that you were getting to some examples, because ISDS sounds bad when they explain it, sounds worse when they start telling you how it actually plays itself out. The Uruguay case is one that I like to think about. Uruguay said, you know what? We noticed that a lot of our citizens are getting lung cancer because of cigarettes. We think if we got more explicit messaging on cigarette packages, people would at least know this product, if used properly, will kill you. <laughs> right? Well, you know, um, Altria ch challenged it in an international tribunal, ISDS, fought them to a standstill. This, uh, Uruguay is a country of about 2.8 2 million people, 3 million people. And they were in dire shape. They had a good case. But it's not even a matter of them losing. you got to afford to fight the case. And guess who saves the day? Michael Bloomberg rides in and gives them the money. They got in a big fight with Australia over this. Only Australia is a big, strong enough country to defend itself in these tribunals. But they had to spend a lot of money. And they didn't win until after a long battle. And there are other examples. You know, and under ISDS, companies challenge Egypt's effort to raise the minimum wage. I'm telling you, this is a usurpation of national sovereignty, and it's wrong. So um, let me just say that the battle that we fought before needs to be fought again. And I will say this, and I'll just take a little bit of license just before I sit down. I love coming to Netroots, and I come, I've come for many years now, and I always enjoy it. This year, for some reason, I've heard a lot of people like, you know, take shots at the Democratic Party quite a bit. Here's what I want to say about that. If you have a legitimate, meaningful, fact-based critique, by all means, make it. But gratuitous shots aren't helping us. Who in the hell voted, against, voted to help defeat the, the, uh, the PPA and the TPP? Lori, who's, whose party was it who was the major force in Congress? So it's easy to say, oh, the, you know, we don't like the, fine. I'm not saying don't criticize us, criticize us. But let's just make sure it is a real criticism, not just a, let me flick them in the head kind of criticism. You understand the difference? Because if you discourage people and tell them that the Democratic Party is just crap, then you are literally helping the people who want to push this, this global stuff on us. <laughs> so, so we're all for some legit, con again, I want those tough conversations. I ran for, uh, I, am the I am the deputy chair of the, of the Democratic Party because I believe in it and I believe it can be better. <laughs> no one is under the illusion that it's perfect. But every time we, you know, just sort of like drop a little bit of salt, you got some people who don't really understand the game yet, who are like, oh yeah, it sucks. And I just, I just want to ask us to make thoughtful criticism. That's all I'm asking for. So let me just sit down and say we're, in, we're, we're setting ourselves up for a big battle. It is a huge one. And I just want to wrap up by saying this. I really appreciate the point you made. As this president is saying, build a wall, build a wall, which to me is simply code for, I don't like Mexicans and neither should you. I mean, do you interpret it another way? Is there another way to interpret that 
build a wall statement? I don't know what it is. To me, it's just open hostility. But it also shows how some corporate elites like Trump cynically manipulate straight out racism to hide what they're actually up to. They are trying to create a race to the bottom situation and jeopardize the health, safety, and welfare of Mexican people in order to make more money for themselves. But they don't take the blame for it. They blame Mexican people for it, whose jobs that they have eliminated, farms they have eliminated, and left no option other than to come north to be exploited again as undocumented workers. So I just want to say that this is a lesson in a way for us because as I mentioned a few things that I think we have to do and then I'm going to sit, one of the things that I hope we really do is explore how we all are manipulated by racism. Now, I know that's a perfectly natural thing to say at net roots, right? But I think we really ought to explore it. If you look at this situation, they are manipulating race to hurt workers of all colors in the United States. And it's key to understand that. So thank you for your presentation. Let me also say we have got to get our, our team cranking in Congress, and we need your help. And then we need you to use your, your, your social and political power to make this a central issue in the communities that you come from. It needs to be a campaign issue in 2017 and 2018. It need, you need to ask your member of Congress, have you seen the draft of the revised NAFTA uh, uh, proposal? And I'm going to tell you, their answer is probably going to be no. Because even though I represent a district of 700,000 people, even though most of them voted for me, I win with 70% of the vote. They won't let me see it. But if I'm representing ExxonMobil, GE, or Bank of America, they can see it. This is undermining the democratic process. And this is happening now, and it certainly happened with TPP. And we raised objection after objection to no avail. So this is another moment when we, when, when, you know, this, is, this thing, I don't know what moniker we're going to call it, but we have got to stand up and really lift up this challenge right away. And there's more to be said about this, but I'll sit down so that we can have some dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Ellison. So we're going to have Q&A now, and I want everyone to understand the urgency of what he said, because he was damn spot on. The talks start Wednesday, as in three days, four days from now. And this is not going to be like TPP, where it takes years. They're trying to finish this at the end of the year. So we have got to get the word out now. What is in the substance of it is going to be determined by the politics of it. So step one is negotiations, our demand, no ISDS, and the other issues. You'll see a fact sheet back there on NAFTA renegotiation has the bullets, just so you can remember it. And there's a attached thing that's got both the more detailed demands and a summary of all the damages you've heard on all of the fronts in one place so you can walk away with it. You saw all those online resources. But once negotiations are done, the New Deal, a New Deal, if they get one, only goes into effect if it goes through Congress. And that gets to what Congressman Ellison said, which is almost all the Democrats are going to be with the program. They're only going to be for an agreement that really does the right thing. They'll be against one that's bullshit. But there is a swing block, small of Democrats, and there is a swing block bigger of Republicans, particularly in the House, for whom, whether or not they're on the right side of this, we need to make a political survival issue. That's going to be our business. First part's negotiations, pressuring for the right agreement. Second part is, if it's not right, stopping it in Congress. If it is, building a majority to pass it. With that, first question, why don't we take some questions and then we'll go down the panel with answers. Yes. The uh, logical response to TPP and NAFTA is the contrapositive. Keith has spoken to the fact that he's never had a good trade bill to, to address and to vote on. And another gentleman, I believe Ben, spoke to the fact that there are components of a good trade deal that have been developed piecemeal. I think we have to develop our own fair trade agreement, and it should be exactly the contrapositive of the free trade 
It should be negotiated in the open by unions, and it should have no ISDS. Of course, it should honor national sovereignty, and part of honoring national sovereignty is honoring the laws of each nation by saying that there will be tariffs if you are producing products in your country that are produced outside of environmental standards in our country, then the differential cost should be reflected in tariffs. This is critically important when we implement a large carbon tax that we make sure that the trade effects of that are consequential and that it is affecting the market around the world. There's a mantra in climate change that I just want to make sure everyone gets a chance. <laughs> These yes. are very important points, and I would actually recommend talking with Ben afterwards, because part of their climate-friendly model takes into account those kind of uh, externalities. Can we What I'm trying to guy? get to is the address of framing issues, and the framing issues are that you have your own agreement, that you don't just modify someone else's agreement, because that speaks to the fact that, well, it was mostly right. No, it's completely wrong, and the, the values that are reflected in TPP and NAFTA are the values of secrecy, of corporate domination and right to rule the country and to overthrow local laws that you've passed. And, and that these idea is are embodied, values that we can enunciate that idea is embodied and, and, and they replace NAFTA. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Was there a question? Yeah, no, <laughs> no, no, we're trying to make sure that the gentleman behind you also gets to talk. Yes. And uh, thank you so much. Mike Fox with Progressive Democrats of America. We are so proud to have stood with everyone on the TPP, and we will be in this fight as well. There is no question. And uh, if I may just very quickly, Keith, uh, a, a line that I use regularly, I believe, came from your father in regards to some of the criticisms that we are hearing, that any jackass can burn down a barn, but it takes a carpenter to build one. Now, and this man's a carpenter that. right there. My dad did say that, but I heard that he got it from somebody else. Fair too. enough. <laughs> Fair enough. It lives. It. it lives. I use it all the time. My question, I apologize. My question is, uh, given that at PDA we're very timeline oriented, do we have any feel for when this would actually get dropped in Congress? Okay. I'm going to actually just take a quick answer to that, which is, it has to be negotiated first, right, and right. their initial deadline, there's a during negotiations every third week. Right. So first negotiation is Wednesday, next round is September 1 through 5. If they go that five. fast, right. by November we'll know if they have a deal. If they do, they're going to try and have a vote early in 2018 before gotcha. we get into politics of, cool. the, of the midterms. However, there's at least a 50-50 chance it rolls over at which point it becomes an issue in 2018. So I would say stay tuned, sign up to the ReplaceNAFTA.org website for timely updates. Lori, can I ask a question and following up to his question, is there any chance they're gonna to try to jam us on this in some sort of a Christmas time holiday thing? If they could, they would. But I mean, but are they statutorily locked, blocked from that? Or the, so just as a small irony for everyone who fought against fast track, this was giving Trump fast track to renegotiate NAFTA was not what the corporations had in mind when they fought so hard to give fast track to the president and take away Congress's authority over trade. But as a result, Trump now has that legislative lose run. So yes, were he so inclined, were they able to get a deal, could they do the notice? All a lot of ifs, I would say 5% chance. They could have a vote, but you all get 90 days notice after they sign it before the vote. Um, I'd like to, uh, my name is Richard Keatley from Tucker, Georgia. I am uh, running for Congress in the 6th Congressional District, trying to beat Karen Handel, who just beat John Ossoff so famously by four points. Um, my question has to do, um, I th thank you for the, one of the most interesting panels here. Um, another panel that I thought was, was very interesting was the one on misclassification of uh, union workers or non-union workers, truckers, um, in which there were 10 people there. And I really appreciate, appreciated your comments on bringing union uh, members and hippies, and I would add here in the 6th District that uh, Hispanics, who are a product of this NAFTA, are 11 percent of the district. They're, they're as large as the African American community in the district that I'm, that I'm working with. Um, a place called Plaza Fiesta in particular. No, I, I canvassed there and there are not um, 
a lot of them that can vote, but their children now are, are at the age where they're voting. And so my question goes to the question of the Democratic Party, because it seems like the party has, it's, it's not, it doesn't have a, an agenda problem. It has a messaging problem sometimes, because we're not articulating these in a way that it gets down to the unionists, to the immigrants, to the African-American community and the workers. And so where can we get some concrete advice on how to narrate this story in a human way um, in the VFW, in Plaza Fiesta, and in the, the black churches so that we can get everyone on board to, to, to take back Congress? <coughs> I, would, I would listen to the presentations you've heard today. And if you want to talk to a Latino community about this thing, I'd just grab uh, Erica's card. I mean, that, that's the smartest thing to do, I think. And then it wouldn't be a bad idea to take a trip to one of the Mecladores or going down to the, uh, uh, go to Mexico and talk to folks. Uh, one of the things I wanted to recommend is that we build greater international solidarity. We are, we need to step up a lot on that. Uh, and uh, those are some recommendations. But you know, I'd say that, you know, look, the, the, the Democratic Party, I, I don't want to get us into a long conversation about what the problem is. I think the core problem is lack of presence. We, we intellectualize the shit out of this stuff, and we need, to get out of, we need to get out of the hallowed halls and get into the neighborhood and start listening to people. That is what we've got to do. Hi, I'm Barbara White Stack. I'm from the United Steelworkers Union. Um, I agree with you completely about international solidarity. You guys really, are great at it. It's really important that it's not just Americans who got hurt. It's also Mexican workers whose wages have declined. It's a, everyone wants to think, oh, yeah, you got all the factories. Yeah, they got the factories and the pollution and the crappy wages. But my question is, um, is there any indication that Enviro's and um, labor will be represented at the, the actual negotiating table? Okay, let's take the last question and then we can do a round. Oh, sorry. I no, it's to do totally that. fine. Hey, my name is Bob Bland from the Women's March. And um, before I did Women's March, I was, I, I, and I still am a manufacturer and uh, in the fashion realm. And I fought tooth and nail against TPP in my role as a manufacturing and particularly domestic manufacturing advocate for years with the Obama administration. And so um, my question is, um, you know, I, I certainly welcome a renegotiation of NAFTA if it is a more fair or balanced NAFTA. I mean, as you know, we, we lost, uh, at least in the apparel and textile industry, over 99% of our jobs, you know, and it, it's continuing. So, um, so it's something that is a really touchy subject for uh, folks around the country who are still working in those realms. Uh, my question is, are Democrats really for these sort of fair free trade agreements? Because I got totally mixed messages from the Obama administration themselves. I never understood really why they were supporting TPP. Do you feel like that was just an executive decision on behalf of the Obama administration, or is this an issue that Democrats actually agree on, that they are solidly anti these sort of gross free trade agreements? All right, perfect question to end with. I'm going to start with Congressman Ellison, who can address that and any of the others he seeks, and we'll go right down the row. Okay, let me, let me say this. The Democratic Party has some people who believe in um, free trade. The overwhelming majority of us are for fair trade. So as I mentioned up there a moment ago, most of the Democrats even voted against NAFTA, though Clinton was the president. Follow me? Yep. And just a few months ago, all but 28 of us, meaning about 175 of us, voted no when the president wanted us to grant him trade promotion authority. Yeah. So what's happening is that 
No party, Republican, Democrat, Green, or otherwise, has people who all believe in exactly the same things. Every party has some people who take a little of that, take a little of that, and but then there's a but then there's a main body of belief, but then there's people who go their own way on certain things. I can tell you that I agree with you when you say that it's confusing, because when people say the president wants TPA and TPP, why are you fighting so hard against it? I had people in my district say, Keith, why are you opposing the first black president on this? Yeah. I'm like, because I believe in black people having jobs in Minneapolis yeah. and in Baltimore. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not worried about the big guy, I'm worried about the people, right? So, by the way, who's from the steel workers? Um, Leo Gerard one time said to me, listen to this, there were 30,000 steel workers in Baltimore. And when Freddie Gray got killed, there were one, two, three. Now that's what he said, and I believe what Leo tells me. What does that mean? That if you are a low income community of color, trade is blasting you. This is an issue that is everybody's fight. Same thing in St. Louis. The offshoring of companies in St. Louis left Ferguson hollowed out. I'm born and raised in the city of Detroit. Let me tell you. It was different 50 years ago. Don, Donna, am I right? Donna's from Detroit too. So what I'm saying is, no, there is no, most Democrats, I'm telling you most, are very, very clear that we need fair trade. Most of us, we have, we're the ones dealing with constituents who've been displaced. But it's not just the jobs that get lost. It's also people worried about food security. Yep. You know, if, if TPP got passed, they would fit, they'd use slave labor to fish that shrimp out of the sea in Asia, and it would not get looked at until it landed on your plate. And you better hope for the best. Yeah, and all of our all of our regulations would be gutted to the lowest level of whatever other country was participating in that trade agreement. And we're now we're also facing that because uh, Secretary Ross is saying that he wants to negotiate TTIP again. And so we might do the same damn thing to Europe. So I, I think that this is an area that if you had a margin call and said, look, how, how do you feel about this issue? You could start with NAFTA or ISPS or whatever you want and made it an election year issue. It could be a bipartisan margin call issue. Like, how, how do you feel about this? Are you pro-American workers or against them? And um, you should definitely use the faces of manufacturers across this country. Uh, we've done it to great effect in the fashion industry. And um, I, I think uh, you're not using all the promotional power you could have. Thank you. So I want to pick up on that, um, what Bob Bland just said, and also the candidate who's running from Georgia, because narrating the story in a humane way is key, and I'm one of the worst wonks of all of them as a recovering trade attorney. So we have all the data at tradewatch.org that you'll need to fight the experts, but how you tell the story behind that data is really key. So at replacenafta.org, it's just a non-branded NAFTA replacement. And by the way, it's not renegotiated, it's replace, because we don't want to tweak the other model. We want a totally different view. At replacenafta.org is a, a list of stories. And it's stories of people who really are affected. And it's people who in the US and Mexico and Canada have been hurt and their communities have been hurt. And some of those stories are the beginnings, I would say, of how to talk about it, because it's in people's own words, or what they were promised, what happened. It's a Nabisco worker in Chicago, mm -hmm. an African-American leader of what is there, the, the, the uh, Food and Confectionery Workers Union, that saw the Oreos that we all have been eating since we were little kids shipped off to be made in Mexico. And that was last year. That is not some 1990s NAFTA story. It is an ongoing thing. It is a woman worker in El Paso. El Paso, by the way, Texas, number one single congressional district is the El Paso Congressional District, actually represented by one of those 28 Democrats who voted the wrong way on fast track, is the number one trade adjustment assistance NAFTA job loss district in the whole United States. 38,000 Latina women, almost exclusively women, almost exclusively Latina, lost their sewing jobs. That was just a total wipeout from the apparel sector. 
Almost all of our blue jeans were made there. El Paso is the blue jean capital of America. And gone, all gone. So I think Bob's stories about trying to be a manufacturer, producing the right way in America is a really p important part of that story. We'd love to have a story from you to add to that stories project, please. I mean, don't go away, let me trade cards with you. Because we need to add not just the workers, but the producers who are trying to do the right thing. We have some great farmer stories there. So those stories are key. Well, a great idea about pairing with the manufacturer, and one way to do that just to close and move on to the next speaker is we did a letter with small businesses against ISDS. It's on our website, tradewatch.org. It's on the Stop the ISDS Corporate Attacks website. It's over 100 small businesses from all over the country who signed up saying, we're for fair trade, we don't want this kind of trade, and that's a place to find partner companies. Just to close on the whole idea of what we're for, there actually was a piece of legislation called the Trade Act, the Trade Reform Accountability Development and Employment Act of 2009 that had 160 co-sponsors. That was the Fair Trade, and Congressman <coughs> Ellison was one of them, that laid out what we're for. It was god-awfully wonky and detailed, but it does lay out in about 80 pages exactly what the right kind of trade agreement and the right kind of trade negotiating process would look like to get the kind of agreements that put people and the planet first. And as Ben said, more or less the narrative summary form of that has been put out from different angles, updated and revised. There's the climate version you can see on the Sierra Club's website. I wrote a piece with the, the chief economist for Vice President Biden, um, Jared Bernstein, that lays out, it was in the American Prospect, that lays out a broad view of what, but those are all just like the gloss overs of the Honest to God legislation. Trade Act of 2009, you can Google it, it's detailed, it lays out exactly what a good trade agreement would look like. I would add some of the new issues that Murshad and his crew are working on as far as access, internet freedom, et cetera, but now passing it on to Murshad, answers to the questions. Yeah, sure. You know, there, there are a few thoughts, and I, I would like to tie, tie a few things here together. Um, I hear a lot of concern trolling from the media and the political pundits uh, targeted towards Democrats all the time, and specifically when they're the minority party. Like, what is your message? What do you stand for? Uh, it's interesting to me that we never heard those concern trolling back in when the Democrats were in power in 2009. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it never happened. And I can guarantee you it didn't happen because I track the did very closely. You know, how does our political system work? Right now, the Republicans are in charge of the White House, the Senate, the House, essentially the Supreme Court, overwhelming majority of the state legislators. The burden is on them to come up with policies and to govern. The burden is not on the opposition party to constantly go to the media and see what our messages are. It's not our burden. But that said, our message has always been there. And now as our, I'm using Democrats, our message has always been there. We have always stood up for the little guys. That's what our party has always been about. And you know, it's not hard to come up with the parameters of what a fair trade deal looks like. You know, Lori and her team, our friends in the labor community, friends in the bar community have laid it out over and over again. You know, I'm not a trade wonk. I'm not even 5% I'm the trade wonk of Lori Wallach is, but I can tell you what are the six parameters are. You want to have a transparent and accountable negotiating process. It's simple. You want to have people in the room. You do not, do not want to have secret courts, number two. You want to you want to have fair and just a, uh, a, a, a judicial review process. You want to have strong and enforcement labor standards. You want to be able to protect the workers and the environment. You want to make sure it, it meets safety standards so that there is not poison in our food, in our children's food. That's number four. You want to make sure that we preserve all the buy American and uh, 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 and preserving local businesses. That's number five. And we want to make sure that we want to have reasonable drug pricing so that big pharma doesn't jack up a thousand percent. It's very, you get those six things, you get a pretty good trade deal. If you, do, if you don't get one of those things, then 
we got a problem. It's very simple. Now, in terms of uh, uh, what, uh, uh, where does Democratic Party uh, stands for? Uh, at, you know, at Credo, we go, we go out, we go hard after Democrats when it counts on 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 criticism. It merits, and I, I moved. I'll share with you just one quick personal story. I, my parents and I, we migrated to the United States in April 24, 1988, with a green card, and I showed up at the local Democratic office in Riverside, California, in the following week to get myself a Dukakis Benson presidential sticker. You know, that's not, so I just dated myself. I was in uh, tenth, uh, ninth grade, you know, and I, we knew we wanted to be Democrats because we knew that was the party of FDR, that was the party of JFK, party of LBJ, party of Great Society, party of Social Security, party that always stood up for the underdogs, party that stood up for the immigrants, party that stood up for the little guys. We always have, we always will, that's the overwhelming majority of what our party is. And the TPP story, it, it, uh, President Obama was on the wrong side of history, was on the wrong side of the party. And now I'm going I, – I have very complex feelings about President Obama because I love the man dearly. I think he, he is an amazing human being. And he had many of his policies, like um, uh, pushing for peace and diplomacy in Iran, he, he gets immense amount of credit for it. And he did a really good job. But on this issue, he was dead wrong. And a few other economic issues, he was just dead wrong. Mm -hmm. But he didn't – and, you know, here's the thing. He's not the Democratic Party. Our party is bigger than President Obama. That's right. Always will be. Our party is bigger than Bernie Sanders. Our party is bigger than uh, Senator Warren. It's our party. It always will be. And that's why there was so overwhelming amount of energy. Uh, I, we dealt with some of the same pushback from our members. Hey, why, why are you pushing back against President Obama? But the overwhelming majority of our mem members also said, got our message. You know, that's, we did not have over 3 million petitions, 50,000 calls, all this amazing energy out on, out in uh, people showing up to protest in Oregon, outside Nike factories. That happened, if people showing up on, where there was, I think in a Hawaii hotel, they were doing some kind of negotiation, people showed up in canoes Conch shell to, uh, protest of TPP protest. made the Guinness World Book of yeah, Records. Yeah, that, that happened because of the, the, the activism on Friends at Greenpeace, Public Citizens, Credo, CIO, Sierra Club, all, all of us. So, uh, and, and, I, and I'm, I feel very confident heading into this coming fight that we're going to have our leader step up. And, you know, I'm not crazy about the better deal messaging, but if you look at the substance, the bullets, it is pretty damn good, and it lay, it lays out pretty good principles on where trade stands for, and that's something we can easily rally around. So, you know, I I, I always have a very pragmatic view of politics. Sometimes people say, I'm ashamed. you know, you need to cheer up or whatnot." But I'm actually pretty fired up about this fight, and 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 I I feel very confident we're going to win win it. Just like we already have won, I don't know, one, twice, three times, four times on Trump Care, we're, mm -hmm. we're going to get so, t uh, we're going to win so much, we're going to get tired of winning. <laughs> get ready for it. All right. Well, I'll, I'll keep it short. Just, you know, I think it's really hard to get people, I, I, with our revolution, we, we push back a lot on TBP. Um, I also worked with the Bernie Sanders campaign, and we also, you know, we did, we, nobody really knew a lot about TPP, and it became a thing uh, with some folks, but it's one of those issues that is really, really hard to explain to people, and it's, I, you know, I might be wrong, right, but it might not be a sexy topic for people to, to understand or to, to, to rally around, and I'm, I always praise citizen. Uh, uh, Lori, for for doing this because it's really hard to talk to people about this. Like, I mean, the, you know, it's to me the important uh, or what we can do and what is important is how do we tell the stories like Lori was saying? How do we tell the stories of American workers? How do we tell the stories of Mexican workers in a way that people will understand and that right now we have the urgency to act? 
And it's not about the party, honestly. Like, I, you know, I am an immigrant. I, I rallied a lot against President Obama because of the deportations. And I became very disillusioned at the Democratic Party for not protecting undocumented uh, immigrants under Obama. Um, but at the same time, you know, I realized that this is a moment when people are really fired up. People are upset. People are just really tired of freaking Donald Trump doing all kinds of things against us. And so we are fired up. And there's many, many ways to get involved. And some people want to go into the Democratic Party and change it. Some people want to be outside of the Democratic, and, outside of the Democratic Party and push for the issues that they care about. And I think everybody's doing their part. Everybody's playing their role. And at this point, at this, at this time, is, it's, we have a vote that's going to happen soon. And so there's not a lot of people in this room, but I think there's people in this room that care about this issue and that we all need to go out there and we need to make a really, really big deal out of this because at the end of the day, it's going to have a lot, a lot of, um, it's going to have a huge impact on people's lives and they're not going to really realize it until it happens. And so we have a huge responsibility today and I just, you know, want to really put it out there that you know, you might not have the statistics. I don't have the statistics. I don't have the numbers in my head, but I know the stories. And that's what's going to stick to people's hearts. And that's don't don't care about the Democratic Party, the Republican Party right now. It's talking about what those people are going through and how you're going to get those stories to people's heads and minds right now and in hearts um, to be able to understand the issue and also act on it and figure out next year who do we need to replace um, when elections come up so let's 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 get uh yeah let's get going thank you erica we're going to close with ben's responses i think we've covered all the questions make sure you fill out one of the postcards on your way out and pick up goodies including if you've got communities you can use them in. we've got stacks of stickers on replace nafta on, and isds grab the goodies ben beachy close i will uh all right so the on the question of you know are is labor and environment going to be represented at the tra table in the trump administration's renegotiation of nafta 2.0 easy answer no there you go. Uh, labor and environment has been very united, just to make clear. Uh, we just recently, our, uh, our CEO, our president, uh, Michael Brune, uh, joined with Leo Gerard from the Steelworkers and putting out a very strong op-ed saying, here is the NAFTA that we, replacement that we need to be for. Um, thus far, we've gotten no indication from the administration that they intend to change course from the closed-door process that has dominated past trade deal negotiations. Um, and in fact, it's not just that these corporate advisors are now advising the Trump administration on what should be in trade deals. They're actually represented inside his administration. I mean, we have coal and oil CEOs inside the administration right now who get to opine on what these deals should include and should not include. Um, so we do not have any indication that there's going to be a break from the closed-door uh, pass. In fact, this coming week in the NAFTA negotiations, there's typically a, a minimal opportunity for stakeholder engagement that does not seem to be present, so it seems like they're eliminating any pretense of transparency or public participation in these negotiations. On the issue of the, uh, of the, you know, the messaging gap and, and how do we talk about this, how do we get more power out there, um, I agree with what's been said, like what Asmar Shev named it. I think it's, a, it's more of a messaging gap than a substance gap. We have been re realizing the impacts of, the, of NAFTA for 23 years. People uh, who have been working on this a decade longer than I have have been talking about the substance of what needs to replace NAFTA for, for a long time. It's, I think, a question of how do we get to the hearts and minds. Um, and as, uh, as Congressman Ellison said, I, I think there are a number of leaders in the Democratic Party who are trying and pushing really hard to get to the hearts and minds. Um, and it's incumbent on all of us uh, to really raise the profile of trade, as Congressman Ellison said. Um, we on the left are really big fans of circling, circle firing squads. We love to attack each other. Man, it's so much fun, isn't it? We can, we, we, of course we need to call each other to the task when need be, but I think in the spirit of let's all be carpenters, I think we all in this room right now before you leave, just ask, what can you do to raise the profile of trade? Because we have a real opportunity here. It's not just playing defense. It's not just keeping Trump from having a really bad deal and getting more political capital. We can use this to convert something that is a political asset from Trump into a political liability. We can take him down on trade. 
but we have to get to the hearts and minds of a broader swath of the American people to do so. We did so with the <coughs> TPP, so there's recent evidence and hope that we can do so again. So I'd say ask all of ourselves, certainly in the Sierra Club, we've got over three million members and we're asking ourselves that question, how do we raise internally within the Sierra Club, how do we raise for our three million members the profile of trade and how do we get to them and say this is the vision that we stand for and so as to use it to indict Trump and anything that comes out of him. We have the opportunity to build a movement even broader than the one that killed the TPP. It's incumbent on everyone sitting here today to do so. Thank you very much, Ben. Everyone, please take some of the goodies, get the word out. Thank you so much for coming. For everyone who's been watching online, thank you very much. We've got a lot of work to do and a lot of resources. Thank you. And to all of our speakers who were amazing, thank you. I thought I really wanted to get used to it.